Ireland, an island of contrasting beauty. Here, on the very fringe of Europe, the rugged Atlantic coastline gives way to a land of greenery, fertility and life. This is a place with an identity all of its own, both physically and culturally, a land of mist and magic that delights visitors from all over the world. Ireland is a land with an ancient past, an ancient Celtic past. It was 1,500 years ago that St. Patrick arrived here, bringing the word of Christ to a people already centuries old. St. Patrick's mission was ultimately successful and his status is secure as one of the greatest figures of Irish legend. But the arrival of Christianity did not eliminate altogether the old ways of life in Ireland. The Celtic tradition lived on. By reading the surviving sagas of Irish Celtic literature, we can see that St. Patrick is just one of the legendary figures of old Ireland. The stories of great heroes such as Cahulin and Finn McCool are still told today keeping alive the Celtic tradition of the Bard. These wonderful stories may be largely mythical, but there are also tales of undeniably real Celtic heroes. The struggles of Vercingetorix and Queen Boudicca also express fully the spirit of a remarkable people. It was a spirit that not even St. Patrick could quench. The man who would become patron saint of Ireland was born around 389 AD, probably in the southwest of England. We know that his family had connections with the early Christian church, although Patrick's own account of his boyhood reveals an early lack of interest in the Christian faith and a typically boyish neglect for his studies. But when he was a youth of about 14, he was taken from his home by a gang of Irish raiders who enslaved him on the island. According to legend, Patrick spent his early days in Ireland looking after his captors' livestock. It was here in the cold, dark and empty nights watching over the cattle that he is said to have learned to turn to God for help and comfort. In so doing, the young man became committed to his faith. During his time on the land, Patrick began to experience visions, urging him to escape from his captivity. After a period of some six years, he succeeded. He fled his master's farm, made his way to the coast, and departed the island of Ireland by sea. He travelled to what is now northern France, where, after calling on God for his help, he returned to the land of his upbringing. But he simply could not settle down. He felt a strange compulsion to return to the land where he had been held captive, Ireland. In preparation, he returned to France, where he received his formal training as a priest before journeying back to the Irish island. Initially, his role was that of assistant to a missionary of more senior status. But when his fellow Christian died on the road, Patrick was ordained and charged with carrying the mission alone. Landing in Strangford Lock, he established his first church in a barn given to him by the local lord, and he began to convert the local population to Christianity. It would be a difficult task, since the Irish people already possessed a deep and ancient culture with a strong spiritual element. They were Celts, a people with their own holy men, the Druids. The Druids, of course, were enormously important to the Celts, um, and their fame has come down through history. Um, it's surprising, therefore, that we don't know a great deal about them. What we can gather about the Druids is that they were the repository of the law in both senses, um, law as in um, 
um, legal system and law as in um, the culture of the Celtic people. We do know that the Druids conducted religious ceremonies and um, from what we can gather these appeared to take place in the famous oak groves. Um, we do know that the Druids or part of the Druidic religion centred around trees and we still have vestiges of the Druidic tree alphabet um, which um, to some extent is um, still associated uh, with the Gallic and the Gallic alphabet. Patrick's mission would bring him into direct conflict with the Druids and their followers. Confronted by the Christian, the Druids ordered a contest of faith, a trial of powers between Patrick and the Druid magician Lockett Moe. It was Patrick who prevailed, and Christianity began to establish itself in Ireland. But still, the crusading priest met resistance, and matters came to a head on Easter Day in 433 AD. The Christian festival coincided with the Druid Spring Festival. At this time, at the instructions of the Druids, all the fires in the land were extinguished, to be relit from the one fire burning on the hill of Tara, which was the royal residence and a profoundly sacred place. This ancient ritual symbolized the coming of spring and the rebirth of the land. Patrick chose to effect a confrontation by lighting his own Easter fire nearby. So when the High King saw this fire, he was absolutely furious and sent his officers to uh, arrest this man. But his druid said to him, Your Majesty, if we do not put out the fire of this new religion today, it will burn forever after in this land. Well, that's what happened. And uh, Patrick escaped because he quoted psalms such as some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in God. And there was a thunderstorm and the king's horses panicked and fled. And uh, he had, the king had other officers at the foot of the mountain to arrest him. But all they saw was a herd of deer. And so the tradition grew that the prayer called Patrick's breastplate is the cry of the deer. Other well-known legends about Patrick are that he banished all the serpents, representing evil, from the island of Ireland. He is also said to have used the three-leaved shamrock as a way to explain the Trinity, the concept of Father, Son and Holy Ghost being one. To this day, the shamrock remains the emblem of St. Patrick and the national flower of the Irish people. Significantly, Patrick is also credited with bringing to Ireland the gift of writing. We know that Irish literacy did begin around the time of Patrick's ministry, helping to further spread the word of Christ. But the arrival of the written word achieved something else for Ireland. It helped preserve the folklore of the existing native tradition. Thanks to the efforts of modern archaeologists, we now know the origin of that tradition. It stems not from Ireland, but from Central Europe. Discoveries of ancient artefacts at locations such as Hallstatt in Austria have revealed the earliest secrets of the people who continued to flourish in St. Patrick's Island over a thousand years later, the Celts. The people of Hallstatt flourished around 700 BC a time when Europe was undergoing a technological revolution. Across the continent, iron began to replace bronze as the principal material for weapons and edged tools. The iron-using innovators of Hallstatt mark the beginning of Celtic culture, and these mysterious craftsmen are the first of the Celtic peoples. There is some mystery about the origins of the Celts but um, scholars nowadays tend to think that they originated somewhere in the region of the Indian subcontinent and by a series of migrations moved um, across Europe, through Spain, up into New Northern Europe and also by a more northerly route through um, Switzerland and into Northern Europe that way. The Celts are often portrayed as wild barbarians 
uh, the antithesis of civilized people. The problem we have here is that one of our major sources for studying the Celts is from the point of view of the Greek and Roman world looking outwards at these so-called barbarians. This is a particular problem with one of our main sources, which is, of course, Julius Caesar's own narrative of the Gallic Wars. It's the Greeks and the Romans who give us such words as barbarian and civilized, and it's arranged according to their cultural preoccupations and preconceptions. We do have a corrective to this, which is from looking at the evidence left by the Celts themselves, from the excavation of their settlements, their houses, their burials, and from the objects in them. And it's quite clear from this that the Celts, by the time of Caesar, were an organized, sophisticated society with a very considerable technological ability and able to produce what to our eyes appear extremely beautiful objects. In the centuries that followed, the Hallstatt people spread throughout Europe, settling an area from the southeast coast of Britain, eastward towards Austria and Switzerland, and south into the Iberian Peninsula. Around 500 BC, a more dynamic phase of development began. This period saw renewed expansion as the Celts began a series of conquests which consolidated their hold on Europe. Celtic tribes from Switzerland and southern Germany invaded Macedonia and Greece, eventually settling in parts of the Balkans and Asia Minor. In Britain, they moved north and west from their initial settlements into Yorkshire and parts of Scotland. And it was only a matter of time before the Celts arrived on the island of Ireland. Celtic tribes also moved south into Italy, famously attacking Rome itself. In the year 390 BC, an army of Celtic warriors carved a Roman citizen army into bloody ruin, forcing their way into what was already a great city. Driven into their high citadel, the Roman citizens could only watch in despair as their proud home was laid to waste. Faced with starvation, they agreed to pay a huge ransom in gold to their triumphant enemy. In simple terms, the Romans were forced to pay the Celts to go away. Their defeat had been total, but there was more humiliation to come. As the gold was being weighed, the Celtic leader Brennus stepped forward and, in a dramatic gesture, flung his sword onto the scales with the words, Ve Victis, woe to the defeated. He wanted even more gold. Left with no other alternative, the Romans had to hand over the last gold in the city it was a bitter humiliation which Rome would never forget. In time, they would have a terrible revenge. The Romans called the invaders the Gauls. The mists of time and the passing of the centuries have obliterated much of their history. But in the fourth century BC, we know that they dominated a vast swathe of land stretching from the Atlantic to the Black Sea and from the Baltic to the warm shores of the Mediterranean. Although classical writers were quick to dismiss them as savage barbarians, the Gauls enjoyed a rich and diverse culture and a clearly structured society. Celtic social organization was based on the tribe, each of which had its own distinctive name tribal identity was intimately connected with territorial integrity. The Celtic tribes were jealous of their borders, which defined a patchwork of petty kingdoms. This persisted in many Celtic areas into relatively modern times. The clan system in Scotland is a continuing legacy of this tribal system. Within the tribe, Celtic society was a rigidly hierarchical caste system. Among the free Celts, it was essentially threefold, kings, nobles, and free commoners. 
But like many ancient peoples, the Celts also had an underclass condemned to a life of poverty and even slavery. The tribal leaders were kings, although the Druids were generally afforded higher status. Each king was elected by the tribal aristocracy from the kin of his predecessor, although he was not necessarily one of his sons. Among later Romanized tribes, the institution of kingship was replaced by that of chief magistrate. Such magistrates ruled in conjunction with the nobles, who were often haughty and aristocratic, and tended to be somewhat aloof from the ordinary people. It was from this class of people that the legendary Celtic warriors were drawn. The warriors were in many ways the embodiment of Celtic society. Privileged and spoiled, their sole purpose in life was fighting. All Celtic social organization was geared to supporting this objective. Warfare formed an essential part of Celtic everyday life, and the warriors were its personification. The Celts were really famous for their spectacular courage and bravado. They mounted successful campaigns, sacked Rome, even assaulted Delphi, but they never established an empire in the classic sense because they were more interested in the pursuit of war rather than the pursuit of empire. This lack of organization was reflected in the way in which they actually waged war. To the Celts, war was something of a cult, and that cult was one of the individual. Julius Caesar, amongst others, mentions the Celts as being particularly ferocious in battle. But he also points out that they lack forward planning and organization. Therefore, in order to defeat the Celts, all that another army needs to do is to outwit them and make them angry, because then they will charge straight at you. And eventually, if they've got enough loot on a campaign, they will go home. This has certain parallels throughout the whole of Celtic history. In particular, the campaigns mounted with the Highlanders by Montrose during the English Civil War, and also for the Scottish armies during the Jacobite rebellions. Fighting, especially single combat, man to man, was regarded as the right and proper way of life for young heroes. As we shall see, this warrior spirit lies at the heart of the greatest stories of Irish legend, stories that are still told today. Sadly, the military muscle of the Celtic tribes would prove inadequate against a truly organized enemy, an enemy such as Julius Caesar's Rome. By the first century BC, the Celts were in retreat Pressure from Rome and the German tribes of the east left only the British Isles and the territory of Gaul as free Celtic lands. These Gallic Celts would ultimately fall to Caesar's legions, but only after an epic struggle in which the Celts succeeded in organizing themselves into a huge single force. They were led by a man whose deeds show that the themes of the Irish legends are rooted in hard historical fact. His name was Vercingetorich. Vercingetorich was a young man in 52 BC, possibly as young as 20. But that year, he displayed military leadership far beyond his years. He was a member of the Arvernian tribe, but he knew that the Gallic Celts would have to be united to stand a chance against the Roman troops then conquering Gaul. Under his leadership, an enormous army was formed, with tribes from all over Gaul contributing fighting men. But the rebellion started inauspiciously. At Avarica, the center of the Bituriga tribe, Caesar's legions were triumphant. According to the Roman leader himself, some 40,000 inhabitants were killed. Camped nearby, Vercingetorich knew that the loss of Avaricum was a real blow, but that it did not mean the end of the uprising. In fact, it was about to gather momentum. 
Caesar now decided to attack Jagovia, capital of Vercingetorich's own tribe, the Averni. He deployed six of his ten Gallic legions. But when he arrived, he found that the Celts had positioned themselves extremely well. Their stronghold was a high plateau, whose southern edge was defined by a huge defensive wall. On the slope below, Vercingetorix placed a detachment of troops, themselves protected by a smaller wall. As a first move, Caesar decided to attack this position, and three legions quickly secured this aim. But in the heat of the battle, the Roman troops charged up the hill towards the main stronghold. Seeing what was occurring, Vercingetorix dispatched forces to attack from the flanks, and after fierce fighting, the Romans were forced to call off the attack. Jagovia proved that the Romans could be beaten, and Vercingetorix was now a hero, a status he never lost. Gallic tribes who had so far stayed neutral now joined with him. The important Adwi tribe, who had previously supported the Romans, now joined the rebels. Caesar's response was to take his legions north to join with the rest of his army, before heading back south towards Provincia. But as the Roman troops made their journey, the leader of their opponents made the first of two decisions that would prove disastrous. Vercingetorix decided to ambush the legions using three detachments of cavalry. He did not use his infantry, and Caesar was able to see off the attack with a massive loss of rebel lives. We will never know for sure why Vercingetorix made this decision, or whether the Romans would have been defeated had foot soldiers been deployed. What we do know is that the Celtic leader's response would also prove to be a mistake. He decided to retreat to the plateau stronghold of Alasia, taking 80,000 of his best troops, while his cavalry set off to raise an army from the whole of Gaul. But Caesar now proved his mastery of siege warfare. Around Alasia, his men constructed an enormous siege works whose pits, towers and ramparts prevented Vercingetorix and his men from breaking out. They also prevented his allies from breaking in. As the besieged Celts began to run out of supplies, their fellow rebels arrived in the form of a stupendous army, possibly a quarter of a million strong. By contrast, the Roman force contained just 50,000. But their siege works proved decisive. After a number of bloody attempts to break through the defences and relieve their leader, the Celtic army gave up the fight and broke up. Shortly afterwards, Vercingetorix surrendered. Though the Gallic rebellion was ultimately defeated, the achievement of Vercingetorix should not be dismissed lightly. Though the Celtic tribes were autonomous and lacked any central administration, he succeeded in putting together an army which may have been the biggest ever seen in Europe at the time. Caesar himself praised a worthy adversary. But superior Roman organization and Caesar's skill ultimately won through. Vercingetorix himself was eventually taken to Rome and forced to take part in a triumphal procession in Caesar's honour. Afterwards, he was ritually strangled. But over 2,000 years later, he remains a potent symbol of rebellion and he is now accepted as the first great national figure of France. Across the Channel in Britain, that status is also enjoyed by a Celtic individual who led fierce resistance to the Romans. Not a man, but one of the most famous women of all history, Boudicca. Or, to use the title she enjoyed in life, Queen Boudicca of the Iceni.
By AD 60, much of Britain was under Roman control or influence, but still the native Celts resisted the power of the legions. That year, the Roman governor, Theutonius, found himself campaigning against the Druids in their power base of North Wales. But while he was engaged there, elsewhere in Britain, one of his colleagues made a foolish mistake that would threaten the Roman occupation itself. In the present-day region of East Anglia, there lived the Iceni tribe, a client state ruled by King Psasatagus. When he died, he named his wife Boudicca and his daughters as the joint heirs to half his kingdom. The other half he offered to Rome, hoping that this would at least maintain some independence for his tribe. But his hope was in vain. Rome chose instead to formally conquer the Iceni territory and their sheer brutality provoked outrage amongst the natives. Iceni settlements were looted and destroyed, with many of their inhabitants carried off to slavery. The Iceni rulers were not spared. In a fatal miscalculation, the daughters of the Iceni queen were raped and Boudicca herself was scourged. It was this, more than anything, that sparked the Iceni into rebellion, a rebellion led by the queen herself. Over the course of the following months, Boudicca proved herself the equal of Vercingetorich. Like her fellow Celt a hundred years before, she gathered together an army. She persuaded a neighboring tribe, the Trinovantes, to join with the Iceni. Soon, she was in a position to lead a huge force of Celtic warriors on an offensive campaign. Their first target was Camulodunum, a lightly defended Roman colony populated by veteran soldiers. The site of present-day Colchester, Camulodunum, had a strong symbolic value, since this was where the Romans had built a great temple to Emperor Claudius, a construction despised by the natives. Under Boudicca's leadership, the colony was attacked and in just two days, it was taken. Fired by an understandable hatred, the Celtic warriors exacted a terrible and bloody revenge. Appropriately, it was the hated temple of Claudius that witnessed the last stand of the Roman defenders, but there was nothing they could do. After an orgy of slaughter, Boudicca emerged triumphant. Far away in Wales, Suetonius was informed of the grim news from Camulodunum. At once, he set off to take charge of the situation. He travelled to the new Roman port of Londinium, but realised that it could not be defended if, as seemed likely, it was attacked. He ordered the city abandoned. Sure enough, Boudicca's army arrived shortly afterwards, slaughtering any who had stayed behind. Meanwhile, Suetonius was organising his British legions in preparation for a full-scale engagement with the rebel forces. Significantly, he was prepared to wait for the opportunity to give battle at a location of his own choosing. But still, the rebellion gathered speed. Fired by the successes of Camulodunum and Londinium, more and more natives flocked to Boudicca's cause. Her forces now headed northwest along the Roman Watling Street and took Verulanium, present-day St Albans, in another bloody conquest. The Roman occupation was now in real danger. If the Britons could defeat Suetonius and his legions, the Romans might be expelled from Britain for good. The decisive battle was not long in coming. At a still undetermined site in the English Midlands, the two armies finally faced each other. As was the case in Roman times, 
The leaders of the opposing forces sought to inspire their troops before the battle. Suetonius' speech was dismissive of his foe, while Queen Boudicca chose to motivate her troops by reminding them of the outrage that had sparked the rebellion in the first place. The formalities over, the battle began. The numerically superior British forces charged the Roman positions, but it was Roman tactics, not strength of manpower, that proved decisive. Acting on the express instructions of their commander, the Roman troops maintained their position until the time came to throw their javelins with deadly effect. As waves of rebel troops drove forward, the Romans advanced in a wedge formation, and the British found themselves hampered in the narrow strip of land that formed the battle site. As Boudicca watched in horror, their troops were soon in flight. The bloodshed was appalling. It is possible that as many as 150,000 perished. What is certain is that Boudicca's great rebellion was finally over. Knowing her likely fate if she were captured, she decided to take poison. Her death marked the end of large-scale British resistance to the Romans, but it also signalled the beginning of her legend. She is the first great figure in the history of Britain, a heroine who was, undeniably, a Celt. The decades that followed Boudicca's death saw Britain become a thoroughly Romanized province, like Gaul before it. But the Romans would never conquer the whole of the British Isles. The Celtic way of life lived on in the highlands of Scotland and in Ireland. Here, the old traditions were maintained, including the age-old Celtic love of storytelling. In Ireland, these tales evolved into a substantial body of poetic literature. And when the arrival of St. Patrick and Christianity brought literacy to Ireland, these tales could at last be written down and preserved. This is the origin of the great stories of Irish legend which we know today. Undoubtedly, and unsurprisingly, the most famous of these stories concern two great warriors, Finn McCool and Cúhulín. Although Cúhulín is likely to have actually existed as a historical figure, sometime during the first century AD, the stories that we now know of his life belong more to the realm of myth than that of fact. But their value is not as a document of history. Instead, they remain great achievements of literature that reveal the concerns of the people who created them. The story of how Cúhulín acquired his name is a popular and typical example of the genre. King Connor of Ulster had a sister named Dectira. Dectira's husband was named Sultum. Sultum was a border guard. He was a member of the Red Branch Knights that were around King Connor, the King of Ulster. His border post was at Dundalk. It's called Dundalgan, which means the Fort of Dalgan. And the fort is just outside the modern County Louth town of Dundalk. At the moment, as I'm speaking, we are in the County Museum in Dundalk. Dectira had a son named Shaitanta. Her husband was not the father of the son. Shaitanta's father was Lu, the sun god of the two-headed Anan. Sultum more or less drops out of the story early on. Shaitanta and his mother Dectira lived at Dundalgan, the border post. What you see now at Dundalgan is the remains of an 18th century house on top of a 12th century Anglo-Norman mat, that is an earthen defensive mound, which is probably on top of an earlier Celtic defensive position, which is on the high point of a ridge overlooking the Castletown River. Shaitanta and Dectira were living there. When Shaitanta was about five years old, some Red Branch Knights came along the road on their way north to Awanmacha, the Ulster capital. Shaitanta said to his mother, who are those men? She said, 
those are red branch knights. Shaitanta said, I want to be a red branch knight. His mother said, yes, dear, when you grow up. No, he said, I want to be a red branch knight now. Which way is Awan Maha? She said, the way those knights are going, just up to the north. He says, OK, I'm off to be a red branch knight. Bye, Mom. And off he went to Awan Maha. When he arrived at Awan Maha at the king's palace, in the green, on the green outside the king's palace, the boy troop were playing hurling. These were the boys who were in training to be warriors up to the age of about 17. And Shaitanta said, well, I know how to do that. This is a good way to meet the boys. So he ran in among them with his hurley, took the schlitter, the ball away from them, knocked them all down, and scored a goal. Well, there were bloody noses and black eyes and broken heads and broken bones and howls and wails all over the playing field. The arms master, Fergus, came out and said, what's all the commotion about? And he said, he took the schlitter away from us, and he came in among us and scored a goal. And Fergus says, what's your name, little fellow? And he says, well, my name is Shaitanta, my mother is Daktira. And Fergus says, well, then, you are Connor's nephew. Come in and meet your uncle Connor. So King Connor took Shaitanta under his arm and took care of him, looked after him, made sure that he got arms and everything. One day, when Connor and the Red Branch Knights were off to a feast at Cullen's house, not too far away, Connor stopped by the playing field and said to Shaitanta, would you like to come along to the feast with us? And Shaitanta said, well, I'm busy playing with the boys now. You go ahead, and I'll follow your chariot tracks. So he went ahead to Cullen's house. They went into the house. They were feasting and drinking, and perhaps a bit more of the drinking than the feasting. When it got dark, Cullen said to Connor, are all of your people here, or are you expecting anybody else? And Connor, forgetting about Shaitanta, said, no, we're all here. Why do you ask? and said, because I have a ferocious guard dog, and anyone who comes here after dark, he will kill immediately. And Connor said, no, we're all here. Let your guard dog out. Well, little Shaitanta came along, having finished his game with the boys, came up to Cullen's house. The guard dog saw Shaitanta. Shaitanta saw the guard dog. Now, Shaitanta was busy throwing his schlitter up into the air, throwing the, the hurley, and throwing his javelin up after them, and catching all three before they fell. He saw the guard dog making for him. He threw the schlitter up into the air, hit it with the hurley, knocked it into the dog's mouth, down his throat, all the way through the dog, out the back, and killed the dog. Connor and Cullen and the Red Branch Knights came down. They ran out. They were very relieved that Shaitanta was all right. But Cullen was lamenting about the death of his guard dog. He said, it took me a year to train and raise that dog until he's the best guard dog in all of Ireland. What am I going to do for a guard dog until I can raise and train another one? And Shaitanta said, well, since I'm the one who killed your guard dog, I will be your guard dog. I will be the Hound of Cullen, which is Cú Chulainn in Irish. And that's how Cú Chulainn got his name. The stories of Cú form part of the Ulster cycle of Irish literature a collection of over 100 stories full of great warriors and heroes. Cuhulin himself is the greatest of these colorful figures, a man prepared to make any sacrifice for the honor of his people, as we find out in the poignant story of Cuhulin and his only son. We're in the County Museum in Dundalk, in County Louth. This is a representation of a cross-section of a bog bogs preserve things for archaeologists. We have a stone axe for the Neolithic. This looks to me to be about early or to mid-Iron Age. This is a bog road. This seems to be a medieval slipper or a moccasin, medieval, late medieval, on up to our beloved 20th century and the plastic milk cartons. The time of the cattle raid of Cooley, the toy in Bocunia, is set just about the time of Christ, so right around this time in the bog. The toy in Bocunia, the cattle raid, and the stories of Cúchulainn are part of the Ulster cycle, and these stories are stories about kings and warriors. Not surprisingly, they're quite bloody and very often tragic. And to me, one of the saddest stories, because in my opinion, something Terrible happens for not a very good reason, and perhaps this is the essence of tragedy. One of the most tragic stories is the story of the death of Kanla. Kanla was Cúchulainn's only son. 
but in the manuscripts it's called the death of Ifa's only son, and this is how it happened. Guhollin was sent away to graduate warrior school on the Isle of Skye. This was a school of Skohach, a female warrior. Another female, female warrior named Ifa attacked Skohach while Guhollin was Skohach's student. And Guhollin was defending Skohach. He was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Ifa, and Ifa got him down on his back. And she was about to kill him. And Guhollin knew her weak point. He says, look, look, look. There are Aoife's horses and her chariot. They're going over the cliff. And Aoife turned around to look. And Guhollin took advantage and got her on her back. And he held his sword up to her throat and said, Now, you will stay with me for a year. You will bear me a son or I'll kill you. She agreed. And so she was pregnant by Guhollin when Guhollin left to come back to Ireland. Guhollin did a very strange thing, something that works out very well according to the story, but uh, it seems to me a little bit silly. First of all, he gave Aoife a gold ring, and he said, when the boy, if it's a son, is old enough to fit this ring, send him to Ireland to find me. And he put Geish on his son. Geish is a prohibition in this case. He said, this is Geish for him. It is Geish, it is taboo, it's prohibited for him to give his name to any single warrior. It's also forbidden for him to refuse a fight. And with that, off he went back home. And he married Emer. According to some stories, Aoife heard about this and was very jealous and decided to put her own geish. And this is where the geish came from on Kanla. But according to the original story, it was Cúhollán's geish. One time, King Connor and the Red Branch Knights were standing around on the strand here at Dundalk. And they saw a boat come across the sea to them. In this boat was a young boy, about 10 years old, and he had a neat little trick. He could throw his sling up into the air and trap birds and bring them down without killing them. Now this is something that Cúhollán himself used to do when he was a boy. The boy came up to the shore. Connor said, well, here's a stranger. He sent one of his warriors down to find out what the boy's name was. The boy, of course, could not give his name to a single warrior. He said, I won't tell you my name. The boy said, well, you tell me or you'll fight me. The boy said, okay, I'll fight you. And so the warrior drew his sword. Connor took a sling, put a stone in the sling, and <laughs> bang in the middle of the forehead on the warrior. The warrior was down. He said, well, I don't like to fight children. Anyway, he went back up to King Connor. Connor sent Connell Kernach, the great Ulster hero, down. Same thing happened to Connell Kernach. He went back to Connor. The only thing to do was to send for Cúhollán. Cúhollán was sent for the champion of the king, the champion of Ulster. It's very likely, and in William Butler Yeats's version of this story in his play, he says very definitely, Cúhollán recognized something in the boy's eyes. He recognized his friend Aoife, the boy's mother, in the boy's eyes, and he suspected this was his son. But Cúhollán had no choice. He was the champion of Ulster. The boy refused to give his name, and he had to challenge him. The boy, because of his geish, could not reveal his name. Cúhollán and Kanna fought. And according to one story, Kanna pushed Cúhollán down under the waves, and Cúhollán nearly drowned. And the weight of pushing him down indented either the boy's or Cúhollán's feet into a stone, which some say years ago could have been seen on the beach at Dundalk. But because Cúhollán was almost beaten by his own son, Cúhollán had to save himself. He got out his trusty Gaibolga, the magic spear that had the prongs, the, the, the barbed prongs inside, and he killed his own son with the Gaibolga. In Yeats's play, it's very touching at the end. He picks up the boy's body, delivers the body to, to King Connor and to the Red Branch Knights, and he says, Men of Ulster, this is what I have done for you. I have killed my only son for you. Cahoulin's love of his people is also revealed in the most famous of the stories of the Ulster cycle, the cattle raid of Cooley. Here again, we have a tale of great heroism and adventure, with Cahoulin compelled once more to fight for Ulster. In this case, his enemy is from the land of Connacht, an enemy keen to take one of the greatest prizes in the whole of Ulster, the brown bull of Cooley. But this enemy is not a man. In the Celtic tradition of the powerful female warrior, Cúhulín must do battle with the Queen of Connacht, Queen Maeve. 
We're on the top of Dune Dalgan, which is an earthen defensive mound which was built in the 12th century by the Anglo-Normans, probably on top of an earlier Celtic defensive site. Dune Dalgan means the fort of Delga. Delga was a king who lived about 4,000 years ago. Locally, this mound, or mat, is called Cúhollán's Castle, or Cúhollán's Mount, because by local tradition, Cúhollán lived here as a child. Behind me, you can see the Carlingford Peninsula, the Carlingford Mountains. The old name of that is the Cooley Hills. And this is where the brown bull of Cooley was kept, in the small kingdom of Cooley. The Toynbo Cooley, the story of the brown bull of Cooley, is a uh, a fantastically long and involved saga. It's a story that begins with a king and queen in bed, the king and queen of Connacht lying in bed, and they get into a little competition match with each other where each says, I'm of a higher status than you. Aren't you lucky you married such a beautiful woman as me who's so rich? And he says, well, you should be lucky that you married such a handsome and, and rich man as me. And this little bedtime competition escalates and they begin to name their wealth. And the queen, who's Maeve, and the king, who's Alil, get to the point where they realize they're of the same level of wealth. And then Alil says, ah, and I have a fantastic bull. Fantastic, you know, as, as they only are in sagas. And she is stumped, because they're equal up to this point, but he has this bull, and she has no equivalent. And what this means for her is that in Irish law, her husband, because he's the wealthier of the two, can dominate her in the marriage. Whereas if she was a woman of equal wealth, then she would be of equal status within the marriage. And Maeve is not a woman who wants to be dominated by her husband. Maeve was born to dominate. So she is determined that she is going to get a bull that exceeds that of her husband, so that she can dominate him in their marriage. And she's heard tell of one in Ulster, and she's going to go get it. And it is the brown bull of Cooley. And the whole of the saga unfolds from that moment. She is determined that she is going to get this brown bull of Cooley in Ulster. And the, the saga unrolls from that. And the saga of the Toynbo Cooley is all the adventures that happen on the way, all of the adventures of the people of Ulster trying to defend their brown bull and themselves against the, the host of warriors brought by Maeve to get this bull. And all of the side stories, you know, all the subplots and, um, and digressions from it. Um, in the end, of course, it all, it all ends rather badly anyway. Um, the bull ends up dying. And, uh, but nevertheless, a good time has been had by all along the way. There are a number of recurring themes in the stories that make up the Ulster cycle. The concept of the individual champion of the tribe is one. The importance of an individual's honour is also repeatedly emphasised, as well as the ongoing need to fight for it. In these Celtic stories, as in Celtic life, it is the skills of warfare that provide the means for social advancement. Even the closest of friends could be compelled to meet in battle, as Cahulin himself finds out, in one of the saddest of all the Ulster cycle tales. This is the river that flows through the village of RD in County Louth. The Irish for RD is Balia a Irdia. This means the town of the Ford of Firdia, and that's its main claim to fame. Now, I'll back up a little bit in the story of the cattle raid of Cooley. Cúhollán wanted to marry Emer. Emer's father said, no, unless you go to graduate school for warriors first. He put this as a condition on Cúhollán because he suspected that Cúhollán would not survive Scohoch's graduate school on the Isle of Skye. He hoped he wouldn't survive. Cúhollán survived, and there are other stories on that, but this is where he met Ferdia. Ferdia became his blood brother, his closer than brother friend. Unfortunately, Ferdia was a fear bog from Connacht. And at the time of the Toyn, the cattle raid of Cooley, he was fighting on the side of Maeve in the invasion against Ulster. Cúhollán was the champion of Ulster, defending Ulster against the invasion. Cúhollán and Ferdia didn't want to fight each other, and they refused to fight each other. 
Queen Maeve was offering her daughter money, fame, everything to Ferdia, and he refused to fight Cuchulain because they were best friends. Finally, Maeve found his weak point. She challenged his courage. She said, I think you're afraid to fight Cuchulain. You're afraid he's going to kill you. That got him. He finally agreed to fight Cuchulain, and by local tradition, the fight was right here at the ford in RD. And there's a standing stone that's been here for a long time to commemorate that event. Now, what happened in the battle, the first day, Cuchulain and Ferdia hacked and sawed at each other with their weapons. Neither got the better of the other. At the end of the day, they bound, out, bound up each other's wounds, they gave each other food and helped each other. Second day, they hacked at each other again, and Cuchulain was afraid he was not going to be able to beat Ferdia. So he told his charioteer, if tomorrow it looks as if I'm losing, I want you to send me the Gai Bolga on the water. Now, the Gai Bolga is a mysterious weapon. It apparently is loaded with springs and barbs. It enters the bolug, the stomach, and when it goes into the stomach, the springs send the barbs through the person's body. And there is no way to extract this weapon without killing the person. So if you're hit by the Gai Bolga, you're dead. This guy Bolga was given to Kuhalan by Skohach, and he was the only one, as far as we know, who ever used it. On the third day, Kuhalan got a very severe wound from Ferdia. Ferdia was about to defeat him, and Kuhalan called for the guy Bolga. His charioteer sent it across the water. Kuhalan took it with his toes and got under Ferdia's defenses and put it into his belly, and he killed his best friend. And then he lamented while the army of the rest of Ireland came toward him. And he was urged by his charioteer to, to get away. They're going to come and they're going to kill you. But Cuchulain went on for pages and pages in the manuscript, lamenting that he had killed his best friend, his blood brother, Ferdia. The second of the great cycles of Irish legend is also dominated by the exploits of one amazing warrior. A man who, in modern terms, could be described as a superhero. This is the Fenian cycle, and their central figure is Finn McCool. Like Cuchulain, Finn McCool was almost certainly a real historical figure who lived around the second century AD. Finn is also a great warrior, but he is also a poet, the leader of a group of men whose skills with weapons are matched by their skills with words. Perhaps because of this, Many students feel that the adventures of Finn represent the greatest stories of Irish legend. Somebody said once that Fionn Macool is everybody, that Fionn Macool is the person. All the intricate and difficult um, feelings and experiences that we have as individuals are Fionn Macool. Fionn is the most generous man who ever lived but also, in some stories, he's quite a mean and stingy man. Fionn is the most noble and um, brave man who ever lived, but in some stories he acts out the part of a coward. Uh, Fionn is the most well-intentioned man who ever lived, yet in some stories he's very vindictive and jealous. So that Fionn is really what we are ourselves. And for um, 1,500 years, uh, Irish people, and Scottish people and Manx people have been imagining the stories of Fionn McCool and have been entertained by them because Fionn is so human and uh, he's so multifaceted also. The richness and diversity of Finn McCool's character contribute vitally to the impact of the stories which concern him. In one of the best known tales, he is furious to find out that his fellow warrior, Dermiot, has run off with Groenia, the king's daughter and object of his own affections. An epic story unfolds as Finn hunts down his fellow Fenian, only for the two men to be eventually reconciled. Throughout the cycle, Finn's pursuit of wisdom is also emphasized. It is this balance of the active and the reflective that give the stories of Finn their continuing appeal. The legend of Fionn McCool includes Fionn taking lots of risks to gain wisdom. 
He's the man who, as a boy, put his thumb in the cauldron of wisdom and gained wisdom. And I think there's something very eternal about that quest for wisdom. Uh, Fian is a hero who's not only a military hero, but he's almost a spiritual hero. You know, he undergoes transformations, he undertakes quests, and he has insight and wisdom in addition to the ability just to fight. And I think as a hero, he's more three-dimensional than Puhu, and he's more three-dimensional than a lot of heroes. And I think for anybody who's a reader of stories, who has an aspiration for insight and knowledge and poetry, then Fian is a natural hero. And the Irish culture um, has always been one which values learning and poetry and insight and wisdom. And so Fian is an eternal hero for that, I think. The stories of Irish legend are one of the most vibrant and enduring legacies of the ancient people who created them. When St. Patrick arrived in Ireland, it was this island and this island alone that fully retained a Celtic identity, the same identity that inspired Vercingetorich and Boudicca, the identity that provides the setting for the stories of Cahoolan and Finn, the Irish legends. There is no reason to suppose that future generations will not find them as fascinating and inspirational as those who have already come to appreciate them across the centuries of time. Scotland is justifiably famous for the beauty of its landscapes, for the magnificent rivers and glens, the forests, and of course, there are also the fairy tale castles. It was in places like this where some of the great legendary stories of Scotland were hatched and played out. This is Needpath Castle here in the borders and we've come here because it represents many of the things that are good about Scotland. It stands on a hill above the River Tweed and it has endured for the centuries, as have many of the stories we're about to explore. Unusually, we've been spared the rain today so we can have a look at Needpath Castle in all its glory. Normally when tourists come to Scotland, they, they bypass this area and they head straight for the highlands, which for them is a great shame because they miss not only some of the best landscapes in the world, they also miss the roots of some of the, the real stories that colour Scotland's history. One of the most famous figures in Scottish history is now William Wallace. Thanks to Hollywood, who came here and made the Braveheart film, Wallace has become one of the single most dominant figures on the medieval landscape of Scotland. But he was certainly a character who deserved to be celebrated. And in those days when there was no real such thing as a nation, he probably was one of the very first patriots. I think William Wallace must be regarded as one of the great icons of Scottish history. A remarkable figure by any stretch of the imagination. Historically, he was the son of a knight, but in legend, he became the common man, the man from nowhere, who appeared in the hour of need of his country. Medieval people believed in the great chain of being, that everything had its correct place. If you took one piece out, and inserted it somewhere else, the whole chain was likely to fragment. So the English accounts stress the unnaturalness of this man. And what's curious is that the Scottish nobility, who should have been leading the armies at the time Wallace was leading them, also distrusted him for the same reason. He was a man of low birth. We know very little about the early life of William Wallace. What we do know is that he was born in Eldersley, in the parish of Paisley, in 1270. But for the rest of the detail on his colourful life, we have to rely on an epic poem, which was written by 
a minstrel known as Blind Harry. And Blind Harry tells the story of William Wallace and his deeds from the time when he stepped onto the national stage in 1297 AD. The first record of Wallace in the history books is the mid-1290s, when we hear the Sheriff of Lanark, William de Hazelrig, who was an Englishman, and part of the English garrison there had assaulted William Wallace's wife. He subsequently murdered her. Wallace took swift and instant revenge. He murdered de Hazelrig, and with some followers, killed the rest of the garrison in the town. He was immediately declared an outlaw and he carried out a guerrilla campaign against what he regarded as an army of occupation. William Wallace, we think, was typical of Scottish opinion round about early 1297. Nobody likes to live in an occupied country. Edward I had conquered Scotland the year before, as he thought, and placed English garrisons in most of the Scottish castles. It would have been fairly uncomfortable, I think, for people living under such a regime. Now, this is the inspiration of Wallace. He was not alone. He operated in the southwest of Scotland. A guy called William Douglas operated in the southeast. Andrew Murray operated in the north. It looks like they were the inspiration, these men, for a popular resistance, and were told of the common people coming out and supporting them. Not surprisingly, the English ruler of Scotland, Edward I, would not be prepared to accept a challenge like that lightly. He dispatched the Earl of Surrey with all of the English forces in Scotland to deal with the rebellion as quickly as they could. They met together on the banks of the Forth in a battle which has become famous in Scottish history, the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Murray, or D. Murray as he was known, and Wallace came together at Stirling in the centre of Scotland. Their armies combined and there the approaching army of Edward under the generalship of Surrey approached them to cross the River Forth at the one bridge at Stirling. It was an old wooden rickety bridge and the heavy English cavalry had to cross this bridge two by two side by side. The Scots army waiting in the woods on the Abbey Hill overlooking the bridge kept their nerve and when the order was given they swooped down and massacred the English army who found it very difficult to manoeuvre in the marshy ground around the bridge. Some of the knights tried to turn and flee back across the bridge causing more chaos but they were outflanked by Wallace's force who fell upon them. The victory was complete and Scotland was for the moment free of the tyrannical English rule of Edward. The Scottish victory at Stirling Bridge was a sensational and unexpected boost for the morale of Wallace and his men and at first it looked as if they would be able to free the whole of Scotland but what Wallace hadn't reckoned with was the intervention of Edward I, who was to become known as the Hammer of the Scots. The legend has it that about five miles west from here, William Wallace with a band of his followers were surprised by an English force and forced to flee. The area here, of course, was then governed by the Fraser family. The last of the Fraser family here, as a Simon Fraser, was taken at the Battle of Dunbar in 1296 and forced to then swear allegiance to Edward I. Shortly after this, Fraser then went to France as a knight banneret and fought for Edward I in his French wars. Fraser returned to this area and became sheriff of Traquair and Ettrick Forest. During this period, certain people wrote to Edward I, suggesting that Fraser's heart wasn't actually in the employ of the English. He was a bit of a nationalist. Fraser, shortly after this, proved this by changing completely to the Scottish side. Now, Edward was not only a first-class ruler, he was also a great politician, a statesman, and above all, he was a soldier who knew the craft of soldiership and he knew what had to be done on the battlefield. Edward marched north with his own army and he engaged Wallace and his forces in the Battle of Falkirk. 
It's really quite hard to assess the methods of warfare used at this time. One of the mysteries is the Scots had been at peace with England and virtually everybody else for a hundred years. So where did they acquire the military expertise which allowed them to resist the English? The Shiltrum was used at Falkirk, which is the battle that Wallace lost. It's more of defensive, I think. It's been compared to a hedgehog with a kind of semicircle and spears sticking out, close ranks and archers between the spears. The idea was the spears would protect the defending troops against a cavalry charge. The archers would do their damage as well. At the Battle of Falkirk in 1298, the Scottish army, under the generalship of Wallace alone, were mainly spearmen, formed into shilterns or phalanxes. The first charge was repulsed, but Edward was a wily soldier and brought up his archers, and the archers rained their deadly arrows upon the shilterns. Many of the Scots fell dead, their ranks were broken, the cavalry came into charge and finished off the job. Wallace indeed was lucky to escape with his life. He had to flee to France, where he tried to enlist the help of the French king. Edward, of course, was back in charge, but Wallace came back to Scotland, tried to regenerate a guerrilla campaign. Unfortunately, he was betrayed by one of his own countrymen, Sir John Monteith, who gave the brave Wallace up to Edward I who in typical fashion had no mercy. He had Wallace taken to London, where he was hung, drawn and quartered, as a lesson to all Scots that they were not, under any circumstances, to trifle with the will of England. I think it's quite possible that the Wars of Independence might never have come about had it not been for the actions of William Wallace. The problem was that Many of the Scottish aristocrats, including Robert Bruce, the future king, had estates in England. They did not want to jeopardise the possession of these estates by taking on the might of Edward I. If the proper rulers of the kingdom are not doing their duty, the common man will come forth and usurp their authority. And that remains an extremely powerful idea right down through the centuries. Shortly after the execution of William Wallace, Another man strode on to the stage of Scottish history, and this time there would be no mistakes. This was Robert Bruce, the man who was to become the most famous king of Scotland. And Bruce was able to unite the whole country behind him and win the independence of the nation. Although it's now associated as a Scottish name, Bruce actually was a Norman name from De Bruce and Bruce came from a Norman family. But by the 1290s, they were very much a part of the Scottish nobility. The area at that time was governed or ruled by a Sir Simon Fraser. The Frasers, of course, were Norman knights. He fought with Bruce, and legend has it, at the Battle of Manfin, he placed Bruce back on his horse three times when he had been unhorsed. Now imagine if this had not happened, the course of history would have been changed. Robert was one of the claimants to the throne, but that claim, along with those of 12 others, was dismissed. And the noblemen of Scotland decided to appoint Edward I as guardian of Scotland. The noblemen of the time, being practical fellows, signed what was called the Ragman's Rule. Bruce then was very much involved in the politics of the time. But he had for himself a long-term view, which was the throne of Scotland. The switching of allegiance in the late 13th, early 14th century is fairly easy to understand. You could see the nobles as a sort of international fraternity who moved back and forward over boundaries and borders quite happily. And they, they didn't necessarily have a commitment to a concept, to an idea. It's very interesting that in 13.4, when Edward is bombarding Stirling Castle and he asks them, on whose authority do you hold this castle against me, Edward I? They say, we hold on behalf of the lion. That's the first abstraction of kingship that you get in the British Isles. They're having to formulate new ways of articulating their political aspirations. What's happening in this very interesting period is that people are working out 
their ideas and their identities and their commitments for the first time against a very tricky background. So they're reacting to present contingencies and redefining themselves in the process. In the medieval world, you were only ever going to be a king if you had the strength and the ability to protect your position, sometimes physically. Bruce and Common were two rivals for the throne, but at the same time they were also occasional allies. And the Bruce clearly decided at some stage that he had to be rid of Common. There are accusations of treachery on both sides. We'll never know what the truth is. But what certainly did happen is that when the two men met together in a chapel near Dumfries, the Bruce drew his dagger and murdered Common. As you would expect, he was excommunicated for such a heinous sin as a murder in a chapel. But with the politics of the day, the Archbishop was still prepared to crown Bruce as King of Scotland, which happened on Palm Sunday in 1306. The family of Common were out to settle the score, and the people of Scotland weren't sure about this man who had murdered his opponent in a church of all places. The English sent an army to confront Bruce's small army at Methven near the town of Perth, and Bruce was very lucky to escape with his life. After that, he left Scotland's shores, and the legend tells that he went to take refuge on an island off the coast of Ireland, it's known as Rathen Island. And it was there that we hear the tale of Bruce and the spider. And that legend is about Bruce sitting in the cave, hiding, thinking, well, will this ever happen? Will I ever be king? When he saw the spider spinning its web, trying and trying again to make the complete circle of the web. And finally, the spider succeeded. So Bruce thought, yes, well, one day I might succeed and I might be king of Scotland, but I must keep trying, I must try again. The first reference to Bruce and the spider comes in Sir Walter Scott's Tales of a Grandfather, 1830. There's not a trace of it before that. There is a legend from the 17th century which associated a spider with the Black Douglas, Robert Bruce's famous sidekick, but no association between Bruce and the spider. What we have here is a great example of instant legend or the invention of tradition. The spider story is a sort of metaphor inserted very much later for whatever happened when Bruce was away taking a think to himself. Uh, what he seems to have decided upon was avoid conventional warfare, avoid pitched battles, we'll never beat the English on their own terms. And so he actually adopted guerrilla tactics from then on and it was very, very successful. Now the story could well be apocryphal, but it is uh, an inspiring legend which has endured down through the centuries. But in 1307, there did come a turning point for the Bruce. In that year, Edward I died, ironically, on his way with his own army to come to Scotland and teach Bruce a lesson. At the age of 68, even the Hammer of the Scots was so worn out by his years in the saddle that he died at Barra on Sands on his way north to fight the Scots. This gave Bruce the breathing space he needed and he began to take the war to the English. There was even better news for Bruce in that the successor to Edward I, the new king, Edward II, was by no means the soldier and the statesman that his father had been. People have come to the conclusion that because this king liked art and painting, had a male favorite and ostensibly neglected his wife, he must therefore have been a homosexual and that has become the accepted view of Edward II. And I'm not sure that the evidence actually stands up to the kind of scrutiny. A great number of kings have had confidence and favorites right through to, to Charles I and beyond. In addition, homosexuality could be punished by being burned alive at the stake. And even the king wouldn't have been able to escape that kind of retribution. With Edward absent from the stage, the Bruce was able to gradually win over the whole of Scotland. One by one, the castles and towns fell from English rule back into the hands of the Scots. Until finally, in 1314, only one castle remained in the hands of the English. This was the castle of Stirling, overlooking the plain of Bannockburn. 
Sir Hugh de Cressingham, the governor of Stirling Castle, had agreed to surrender to the Bruce if he was not relieved by Midsummer's Day, 1314. Now, even a king of questionable strength and vigor, such as Edward II, couldn't afford to ignore a challenge like that. If he lost Stirling, he lost Scotland. And to try and make sure that didn't happen, he assembled one of the greatest armies ever to leave England. It was led by a powerful vanguard of knights, there was a huge body of men at arms, and of course there were the famous longbowmen. They were to meet on the field at Bannockburn. It came to pass in 1314, the battle to end all battles in Scottish terms was fought. The army of Edward II was very much stronger in terms of numbers, but Bruce had made preparations for the coming of the English army. He had took up a very strong defensive position. He had dug pits. In these pits, he had put spiked poles to trap the cavalry and he waited patiently for the English army to advance. The Battle of Bannockburn was Bruce's defining moments. And one of the reasons for his success in that battle was his ability to prepare not only his army, but also the ground on which they would fight. He chose the River Forth to define the boundary of the battlefield and he knew the English had to come and relieve Stirling Castle. He knew the road they would be approaching, and as a consequence of that, he was able to spend time preparing defensive positions on the battlefield. Those defensive positions took the form of a number of pits, which were dug across the projected path of any English cavalry charge, and a number of fiendishly horrible devices known as caltrops, which were metal spikes that were strewn across the path of any projected cavalry charge in the hope that they would stick into the hooves. By doing so, Bruce was able to spend time drilling the men, getting his army to act in a cohesive fashion and preparing the terrain. That was very unusual on a medieval battlefield and it paid dividends in the Battle of Bannockburn. Instead of awaiting the English attack, he launched his own shiltrons in an attack against the English cavalry. This was certainly throwing a spanner in the works and certainly not the kind of thing that Edward II would have expected. By his ability to use the river to define the battlefield, the Bruce was able to pen the English army into a fairly compact and fairly narrow piece of ground. They couldn't use their archers as they'd done at Falkirk because the archers were behind not only the cavalry, but the billmen who were in the second rank. This meant that the Scots infantry were free from the dangers of the arrow storm that had decimated them at Falkirk and also in the Battle of Medvin. So what we had here was a general who was able to decide not only his tactics, also how he was gonna use the field to his own advantage. Some of the English archers did actually manage to take up a position on the flank and begin to cause casualties among the Scots infantry with their arrow fire from the flank. And the Bruce had had enough wisdom to keep back the tiny reserve of cavalry he did have, only 500 men, lightly armoured on small horses. But they were to prove absolutely decisive at that point because it was then that he released his small force of cavalry to disperse the English archers and keep the battle going in favour of the Scots. The English cavalry advanced, but could only advance very slowly because they had a very limited section of dry land in which they could advance. That attack was repulsed easily by the Scottish spearmen, and then the next day, the spearmen beat off the English army. As the English army were turning to flee, the reinforcements or the camp followers came into the battle and the rout was complete. The English made off. The king himself was lucky to escape, but his wife and daughter were taken prisoner and ransomed for a great price. Bannockburn was undoubtedly a colossal victory. There's no question about it. Probably the most spectacular victory in Scottish history. As such, it's never been forgotten by certain sections of the Scottish community. The Scottish National Party, for example, still holds annual rallies at Bannockburn. 
I suppose it's seen as a kind of a, a shrine of Scottish independence or whatever. But it didn't really achieve very much as a battle. The whole point of fighting a battle was A, to get rid of the English, which they succeeded in doing, B, to get the English to recognise the legitimacy of Bruce's title to be King of Scots. You had to raid all the way through England to hit the King at Westminster. So they could run around the north of England till the cows came home. It would never affect the attitudes of the, the kind of home county mentality. Sadly, the battlefields of Britain haven't benefited from the kind of protection that uh, a field like Gettysburg has had, for example, in the States. They've been encroached by modern developments, and in Bannockburn's case, uh, housing development right onto the battlefield. And also, the landscape has been changed by the advent of modern farming techniques. Behind me here, we've got the River Tweed, which can represent, for us, the River Forth that was going to give the English army so many problems, particularly during the retreat. Opposite, we've got the mature trees, similar to the kind of features of the new park which hid the Scottish army so effectively on the days before the battle. Then across here, we've got a flat plain which stretches from the river. It hasn't been changed by modern farming techniques. It hasn't been intensively cropped by animals. And as such, we can see the, the tussocky nature of the ground. And you can appreciate just how difficult it would be for cavalry to make progress across ground like this. There are a number of things that can trap the ankles and break legs of horses. Towering over this landscape, we have the castle of Needpath. Now, Needpath is obviously a much smaller castle than Stirling, but you do get a feel almost of the battlefield in miniature and what the main features were. In 1320, what the Scots did, the nobles, barons, freeholders and the community of the realm of Scotland, they sent a letter to the Pope of the day, really asking the Pope to put pressure on the English king to recognise Bruce's title. A declaration of Scottish independence. And it, there are some very, very interesting ideas in this document. They actually say, if Robert Bruce should ever submit our kingdom to the King of England or the English, we will remove him and set up another better able to govern us in his place. Now, they had no intentions of removing Robert Bruce, but they're trying to show if Robert even hints at stepping out of line, they're going to remove him. So what's that? That is the earliest statement of the contractual theory of monarchy in European history. They're saying the king is answerable to his subjects. The next section of the Declaration of our Broth goes on to say, and this is quoted all over the place, but it's still got, it's, it's very moving. For so long as a hundred of us remain alive, we shall never surrender. It is not for riches, nor for glory, nor for honours that we fight, but for freedom alone, which no honest man will lose, but with life itself. If the Battle of Bannockburn was to prove Scotland's greatest day in its military history, the blackest day was to come almost 200 years later at the Battle of Flodden. On that day in a field in the north of England, 10,000 Scotsmen lost their lives under the leadership of King James IV. In many respects, James could have been a greater king than the Bruce. He was a cultured man and he understood the need for education in a changing world. This was the time of the Renaissance and James was very much a Renaissance king. He established Scotland's third university at Aberdeen, for example, and he was terrifically interested in the fields of literature and art and science. Uh, for him, the application of science came very much in the exploration of gunpowder. He was fanatical about artillery and its employment on the battlefield. Unfortunately, the artillery was to let him down on the day of his greatest trial. James IV of Scotland came to the throne in 1488 following the untimely death of his father. Much trade was carried out between Scotland and the Low Countries and France. In terms of culture, he set up the third university in Scotland in Aberdeen the College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, set up a printing press, encouraged uh, writing and literature, and so did a lot of good for the education of Scots and Scotland. His brother-in-law, 
Henry VIII of England, had formed the Holy League with the King of Spain and the Doge of Venice. And their aim was to attack the power of Louis, the King of France. Now, there had been an ancient alliance between France and Scotland called the Old Alliance, which went back to the 13th century. But Louis, knowing that James was a very gallant and chivalrous gentleman, decided that it would be better if his wife, the Queen, wrote to James seeking his assistance. This she did with all pomp and circumstance, and with her letter she sent a lovely turquoise ring. Unfortunately, James was not the kind of man who could resist a call to chivalry like that, and he brought together a great army of Scotland and invaded England. It was a big mistake on James's part, and the Scots army came disastrously unstuck when they moved into England in order to support the French in September 1513. The Battle of Flodden was an unmitigated disaster for the Scots and the famous image of the sole survivor returning to Edinburgh still haunts the Scots today. James himself is alleged to have been forewarned by an apparition, the famous Blue Man, who appeared to him before the campaign. At Linlithgow, where the king was praying, this man came to the church, knocking on the door, insisting that he saw the king. The man wearing a blue cloak, it is said, had been sent by his mother with a warning, a dire warning to the king that he should not set out in this journey because it would be very, very dangerous, both for him and his companions. Furthermore, his mother had told him to give the king the message that the king should not take the advice of women. Whether it's true or not, or whether it's been embroidered over the years, it certainly was a legend that was prevalent at the time of the battle. It was said that there wasn't a single family in the whole of Scotland that was left untouched by the disaster at Flodden. So great were the casualties that they were lamenting throughout the land. The legend of Robin Hood is an enduring tale. Scotland has its own version of that in the legend of Rob Roy. I think the thing that appeals to people about Rob Roy is much the same as that which appeals about Robin Hood. The fact that he's what's called a social bandit, an outlaw who defends his community against alien or elite influences. Rob Roy first of all came from an outlawed clan, the McGregors, who'd been outlawed as a result of the exercise of state power in the 1590s. He was associated with the Jacobite Risings and their opposition to the Union in 1715 and 1719. He was also associated with the ability to act autonomously in defiance of authority. In Scotland, we have our own version of Robin Hood, and his name is Rob Roy MacGregor, and he lived here in this area called Balwhidder. Behind me is the Curtain Burn, which flows down to Loch Voyle and passes by the alehouse where Rob Roy used to drink, not 300 yards from here. He drove cattle to markets in the south, uh, down to England, and as he reached his late teens, he was installed in a farm not far from here on the southern shores of Loch Voyle. Later, in 1693, he was married to Mary MacGregor of Cromer, and it was here in this glen that he started his married life. As well as farming and droving, he engaged in a little what we call lifting or reaving, that was stealing cattle and reselling them. At that time, Rob's business was doing very well, and he arranged to borrow some money from a wealthy landowner, the Duke of Montrose. Sadly, all did not go to plan. Rob gave the money to his trusty lieutenant. The man disappeared. So did the money. Rob Roy was declared bankrupt, 
and in his absence, his wife and children were evicted from the property on the shores of Loch Lomond. Rob took revenge on Montrose by stealing his cattle, stealing his rent, and in some cases, stealing the rent that the tenants, the poor tenants had paid to his factor and then giving the money back to the tenants. Many dramatizations of Rob Roy were put on from the 1820s onwards. I think there were 30 or 40, my memory serves are right, dramatizations of Rob Roy in the 19th century. He was very much a figure taken up as a result of Scott's novel. And yet, Scott's novel was called Rob Roy for a reason, because Rob Roy already had a status on which Scott was drawing. So I think we can say that Scott was a great publicity agent for Rob Roy. Rob became implicated in the political struggles of the time, the struggle to replace the Stuart kings on the throne of Scotland. He was given a pardon towards the end of his life and he ended his days here further up the glen at Inverloch Larrig. He had a dispute with a neighbour called James McLaren over a field at Invernenty. Rob came marching down the glen with a force of about a hundred men. But when he came to the western side of the burn at the bottom near the loch, there was a force of 300 waiting to meet him. Thinking upon this, and being quite a sensible man in his old age, he thought, this is not the day for a fight, because we're sadly outnumbered. But he felt that all these warrior-like men having come together, they should have some fighting, at least. So they decided to fight a duel, and there was Rob being the man he was, putting himself forward for the fight. The other side put forward a young champion, a young Stuart. They fought, and the agreement had been first blood, and eventually the young man got the better of Rob and gave him a nick on the arm. But that wound was the end of him. It went septic, but before he died, McLaren, this neighbor with whom he had had the dispute, heard he was dying and came to gloat at Rob on his deathbed. Rob heard he was coming, called for his wife to dress him in his best plaid, bring him his sword and his gun. And when McLaren came in, he was aghast to see Rob looking as fierce as ever, nowhere near death, he thought. So he made his groveling apologies and left hurriedly. When he did die, he was buried down here at the cemetery at the churchyard. There was a huge funeral. Hundreds of people came, and the funeral bill came to over 400 pounds. Rob's estate was valued at 146 pounds. So even in death, poor Mary, that long-suffering wife, had to work with the help of her sons to pay off the debt for the funeral. The story of Rob Roy goes beyond the bounds of his locality, the west of Scotland and Perthshire, that they're spread throughout Scotland. Um, even in Aberdeenshire, there, there are caves which are associated with Rob Roy, and these are a function of storytelling, not of history. And it's very interesting that, that such a powerful folk mythos, mythology, has been built up around somebody who was a historical figure and died no more than 260 odd years ago. What we do know for certain is that Rob Roy was present at some of the biggest battles of the Jacobite Wars. He fought at the Battle of Sheriff Muir in 1715, and he was also present on the ill-fated campaign which led to the Battle of Glen Shiel in 1719. By 1745, the cause that Rob Roy had gone out to support should have been dead and buried. But there was one last act to be played in the tragedy, and that tragedy would be led by the son of the old pretender, Charles Edward Stuart. Charles Edward Stuart is better known to Scottish history as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Prince Charles Edward Stuart was born in 1720 in Rome. He was the son of the old pretender to the throne of Scotland. His father was in turn the son of the deposed king, King James II of Scotland and England, who had been deposed in what was called the Glorious Bloodless Revolution in 1688. The powers that be, the British government of the time, felt that they should have a Protestant king. So they invited Prince William of Orange in the Netherlands 
and his Queen Mary to become King and Queen of Britain. They came to the throne, but there was a movement called the Jacobite movement, who were keen to have the Stuart family line restored to the throne. The clans and other supporters whom General Cope and the government army counted on as coming out to support the government simply didn't do it. There was relatively little interest, even from opponents of the Jacobite cause, in actually standing up and fighting against them. There was a good deal of passive sympathy with the Jacobites among those who weren't prepared to support them. And effectively the rest of the political nation sat on their hands. Indeed it's arguable that that was the case in England too, at least while the Jacobites were marching south. The religious landscape had also changed. Scotland was very much a Protestant country and for many the Stuarts represented a return to the old Catholic religion and as such they couldn't command the popular support in what was very much a Presbyterian country. In 1719, a great storm had destroyed the Spanish fleet which had been brought together to support an attempt by the nominal head of Scotland, James III, to regain the throne. In 1744, another great storm wrecked the French fleet that had been brought together in support of a claim by his son. Charles Edward Stuart. There were never enough people who were prepared to support the cause and when the French help that had been promised failed to materialise, really the whole expedition should have been cancelled then and quite a few of the, the wiser Highland chiefs knew that the end had really come. Nonetheless, Charles was able to persuade them to continue on in the cause and the ill-fated rebellion of 1745 was the consequence. He had arrived with just seven men. They were known as the Seven Men of Moidart. In August 1745, he arranged to raise the standard at Glenfinnan. That morning, he was rowed up a loch to the point at the top of Loch Shiel, where he had put out the word for the Highlanders to gather. At first, they came in dribs and drabs, there weren't many there. But by the end of the day, Cameron of Lochiel had come with over 500 men. And so the tally at the end of the day was almost a thousand. He marched south with this army, gathering men and support as he went. And in no time at all, he reached Edinburgh. He took Edinburgh quite easily. He defeated the army of the government under Johnny Cope at the Battle of Preston Pans and the famous tune, Hey Johnny Cope, are you walking yet? Are you awake yet, General Cope? Became a byword for the Jacobite army. After the Jacobite army left Edinburgh, it split into two columns. One column actually ended up here between Peebles and the castle and camped overnight en route to England. And it's also recorded that the local populace were much put out by this. Now this column was commanded by Sir George Murray contained most of the artillery, we're talking about a considerable number of men and horses. The officers themselves probably took billets in the town itself, but the men would have been left to rough it down in this flat area by the river. The river, of course, providing water for the horses and the men. It was then that Charles' real master plan was unfolded. Despite the fact that he had claimed the throne of Scotland and actually had his father proclaimed as James VIII of Scotland, he decided that his real mission lay in winning the throne of England. And that's when things really went wrong. Lord Murray proved himself to be an excellent commander at Preston Pans, and it was his ability that glued together the Jacobite army. But Murray was no fool, and he agreed to march on England only on the condition that they would receive French help. The prince by this stage must have known that no French help was ever going to materialise, but nonetheless he allowed the army to embark on its march into England, probably in the hope that what he saw as his English subjects would raise up in arms to help him. Once again this didn't happen, other than a motley collection of volunteers that they picked up and formed into what was optimistically known as the Manchester Regiment, the English population 
were at best indifferent to the Jacobites and certainly large sections were openly hostile. They advanced as far as Derby, just 120 miles north of London. But when they got to Derby, they hesitated. They had a council of war and Charlie was advised that he should turn back. But in London, they were making arrangements to move the king from town. And it was at that time our national anthem, God Save the King, was penned. Because there was such a fear that these wild Highlanders would come and take the town. Murray and the other chiefs were prepared to allow the charade of an invasion to progress as far as Derby. But by then, they knew the army had to be turned for home. Having done so, they were able to forge together a victory over the forces of Hawley, who were pursuing them into Scotland. But ultimately, they were once again forced to retreat, this time to Inverness, the Highland capital. Even at Inverness, they were still pursued by William, Duke of Cumberland, second son of George II. Cumberland was on a personal mission to ensure there would never again be a Jacobite rebellion in Scotland. And as such, he used the government forces to ruthlessly suppress the Highland army in the Battle of Culloden in April 1746. Cumberland and his men, an army of about 9,000 strong, were camped at Nairn, not far from Inverness. And the prince heard of this, he also heard it was Cumberland's birthday. And he reckoned that Cumberland would be entertaining his army to a night of celebration in honour of his birthday. So they planned a night raid, a night attack. On their approach, the guard was alerted and the attack was aborted. The troops, hungry and tired now, made their way back to Culloden Moor. The next morning, the government army marched up the Highlanders stood in tight ranks. Against them was a highly regimented army of 9,000 troops, mostly regular troops. But believe it or not, there was some Scots fighting on that side as well, those Scots who took the government side. There was some confusion in the Jacobite ranks as opposed to the giving of orders. The command to charge was not passed, and the, the English artillery wrought havoc In the space of 45 minutes, the battle was lost. The order had been given to the government troops to spare no quarter. The wounded were killed where they lay. Bonnie Prince Charlie, though, escaped from the battle. As part of his escape, he was disguised once as an Irish maid and was assisted in this part of the escape by one Flora MacDonald. Charles and Flora are a very poignant pair. A young woman doing her duty as she sees it to protect and succour her prince from the threat of arrest and death. It is innocent and therefore very much closer to a fairy story than these things so often are. But it also has very powerful symbolic resonance that it makes a very good counterpart to a male-oriented military campaign that when he falls on hard times, it's a woman who suckers and rescues him and so on. It gives a kind of domestic order to the public political side of the earlier part of the Jacobite Rising. One of the things that's very important is that in 18th century Jacobite political rhetoric, political discourse, Scotland, indeed Ireland too, but Scotland was portrayed as a woman. A woman who would only be restored to fertility when her king came back, this drew an ancient Celtic mythology, and her land is made fertile again. Therefore, Flora, with a good name for that kind of symbolism, stood in very effectively for Scotland as a whole, receiving Charles into her bosom. And that meant in a way that you could portray the essence of the land, as with its feminine essence, remain true to the Stuarts, after the battle, the prince rather ungraciously told his followers to fend for themselves, while he himself tried to escape back into exile into France. The famous incidents where he had to dress as a woman and 
hide in the heather are all very well documented. But if we look at the evidence, I'm afraid the prince's later behaviour certainly doesn't reflect well on him as a man. He doesn't appear to have shown much gratitude for the people who had lost everything in the support of the Stuart cause. Charles remains a controversial figure. He became a Scottish icon, despite the fact of his mixed Scottish, English, Polish ancestry, and the fact that he was born in Rome, and the fact that Lord Elko, one of his supporters, said, there you go, you cowardly Italian, as he was led off the battlefield of Culloden. Despite all these things, Charles, first of all, cultivated a Scottish identity. All his army were uniformed in tartan, including himself. He appointed a Gallic tutor, who was in fact one of the foremost Gallic poets of his day, and so it was a very shrewd move because that was more free publicity. And on the route south, he marched on foot at the head of his army, as if he were a great chieftain of old, more in a Finn McCool than an 18th century claimant to a throne. that time, the Saxons strengthened in multitude and grew in Britain. On the death of Hengist, Octa his son passed from the northern part of Britain to the kingdom of the Kentish men, and from him arose the kings of the Kentish men. Then Arthur fought against them in those days with the kings of the Britons. But he himself was leader of the battles. Through 14 centuries, the shadowy but powerful figure of Arthur has been distorted by poets, chroniclers, politicians and kings. The image has been used for entertainment and even propaganda. From a Romano-British warlord fighting the Saxon invaders, he had been turned, in an ironic twist, into the most English of kings, epitomizing the full flowering of medieval chivalry. So there are two Arthurs, the armor-plated king enthroned in Camelot at his round table, surrounded by goodly knights and fair ladies, dispensing justice and defending the weak and oppressed. And the real Arthur, a military commander, a capable strategist and diplomat, as he would have needed to be in such turbulent times. It's possible he may not even have been of noble birth, making it easier for him to stand aside from the tribal differences and the squabbles of petty kingdoms. He was instead a man who could command a large, highly mobile force of cavalry and infantry, crossing all tribal frontiers, making all territories his battlefield against the Saxon foe. After the death of Uther Pendragon, the leaders of the Britons assembled from their various provinces in the town of Silchester and there suggested to Debricius, the Archbishop of the City of the Legions, that as their king, he should crown Arthur, the son of Uther. Necessity urged them on, for as soon as the Saxons heard of the death of Uther, they invited their own countrymen over from Germany, appointed Colgrin as their leader, and began to do their utmost to exterminate the Britons. They had already overrun all that section of the island which stretches from the River Humber to the sea named Caithness. Dubricius lamented the sad state of his country. He called the other bishops to him and bestowed the crown of the kingdom upon Arthur. Arthur was a young man, only 15 years old, 
but he was of outstanding courage and generosity, and his inborn goodness gave him such grace that he was loved by almost all the people. But how could this highly successful British general have become the fanciful king of medieval legend? The answer lies partly with Geoffrey of Monmouth, a Welsh cleric of Breton descent, who was responsible for bringing Arthur to a wider audience by writing his History of the Kings of Britain in 1136. This work, properly titled The Historia Regum Britannia, was written in Latin and can be fairly described as one of the most influential books on Arthur. Well, Geoffrey of Monmouth was a fibber, I'm afraid. Uh, as his name betrays, he um, was a monk at Monmouth and then he moved to Oxford. And he was so keen on the Arthurian story that he was actually nicknamed Arthur, Geoffrey Arthur. And he was a real Arthur um, fanatic. And he wrote this book, which was published in the sense that manuscript editions were published in 1139. Uh, and it purports to be a history of Britain from the day that the first settler, Brutus, a Trojan, landed in Britain at Totnes, and they used to show his footprint there about the time just before the Trojan War, and came right up to about um, the end of the um, um, seventh century AD. And he gives you conversations between prehistoric monarchs from the Bron what would have been the Bronze Age or the early Iron Age. And uh, every adventure and in every age he knows what's going on. But it's a, a marvellous read and uh, that's what made it um, perhaps the greatest bestseller of the Middle Ages. And I think he was doing the job, a fair job as he saw it. He had, you do sense a twinkle in his eye when you're reading it. At one point he says that um, an eagle on the walls of Gloucester uttered a prophecy, he said, which I would tell you if I believed it was true. Well, later on he goes and tells you, so <laughs> uh, I don't think he cared if you believed or not. And I'm, he may have been surprised at the extent to which people believed it. Geoffrey's history of the kings of Britain might have seemed, on the face of it, a serious attempt to record British history, and more particularly, to portray an accurate picture of Arthur, drawn from many reliable sources. After all, Geoffrey was a churchman who had received an excellent education for his time. But it would seem that Geoffrey entered the church in order to further his literary ambitions and not because of any religious zeal. Having no recognized archaeological authorities to hold him in check, Geoffrey was free to create an Arthur in the image of his own royal patrons. Whenever I have chance to think about the history of the kings of Britain, on those occasions when I've been turning over a great many such matters in my mind, it has seemed a remarkable thing to me that, apart from such mention of them as Gildas and Bede had each made in a brilliant book on the subject, I have not been able to discover anything at all on the kings who lived here before the incarnation of Christ, or, indeed, about Arthur, and all the others who followed on after the incarnation. Yet, the deeds of these men were such that they deserved to be praised for all time. What is more, these deeds were handed joyfully down in oral tradition, just as if they had been committed to writing by many people who had only their memory to rely on. Geoffrey obviously felt little or no need to depict Arthur as he'd encountered him in the writings of the 8th century chronicler Nennius. Thus, his Arthur dresses and acts exactly as a 12th century monarch, and his descriptions of warfare and the social scene are based on his own experience. Geoffrey's intention, as far as we can tell, was not to deceive, but to entertain. He was as enthralled by the enigma of Arthur as many before him had been. With true Celtic exaggeration, he romanticized Arthur in a way that had never before been so blatant or so successful. That success was to spark off the development of a legendary Arthur. At a time when I was giving a good deal of attention to such matters, Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, a man skilled in the art of public speaking and well informed about the history of foreign countries, presented me with a certain very ancient book written in the British language. This book, attractively composed to form a consecutive and orderly narrative, set out all the deeds of these men from Brutus, the first king of the Britons, down to Cadwallader, the son of Cadwallo. At Walter's request, I have taken the trouble to translate the book into Latin, 
Although, indeed, I have been content with my own expressions and my own homely style, and I have gathered no gaudy flowers of speech in other men's gardens. If I had adorned my page with high-flown rhetorical figures, I should have bored my readers, for they would have been forced to spend more time discovering the meaning of my words than in following the story. In the eight centuries that have passed since Geoffrey of Monmouth completed his great work, other writers and poets have been inspired to compose new tales of Arthur, adding fashionable elements such as courtly love and deeds of heroism based on a code of medieval chivalry. Chrétien de Troyes, the French poet, writing just 30 years after Geoffrey, added the important new ingredients of the grail and many new knights as part of Arthur's court, notably Sir Lancelot. He is also responsible for naming Arthur's stronghold as Camelot, a name he may have borrowed and corrupted from the Roman name for Colchester, Camelodunum. Robert de Boron, writing around 1200, introduced the concept of the sword in the stone, and in the generations that followed, author after author added to the story, embroidering and inventing, culminating in Sir Thomas Mallory's Mordatha, and nearer to the present, Tennyson's Idylls of the King. These are all celebrations of an Arthur many times removed from the man who united the British against the heathen Saxons. There was undoubtedly an Arthur long before Geoffrey wrote and he'd picked up a real character. And so are some of the others. For instance, um, Guinevere uh, appears in Welsh stories, which are certainly older than Geoffrey of Monmouth, as uh, Gwenhuiva. And um, some of the knights appear too, like Kay and Bedivere, who are Kai and Bedwyr. Uh, but Lancelot doesn't, unfortunately. He comes clearly from a French um, stories written at the end of the 12th century, slightly later. Though that again includes very old myths of the Lady of the Lake and so forth. Um, the, the sword and the stone, I'm sure, is older and must represent an, an ancient myth which you find in other cultures. The um, round table, I think, must also go back to very old ideas. To me, the most striking episode, and the one which most people remember, which I'm sure is very much older, and that is the mysterious birth of Arthur, which people will remember when um, Uther Pendragon is disguised by Merlin's magic as the husband of the beautiful Igerna on Tintagel, and he sleeps with her that night, and that night has begotten the infant Arthur, who's later born and becomes king. Um, <clears throat> well, that's a very old story, much older than Geoffrey of Monmouth. Before Geoffrey romanticised and popularised him, Arthur was a name heard in songs and folk tales, remembered and passed on around the winter firesides of those in whom the Celtic blood still ran strong. Small wonder then, perhaps, that his story was so helpful and so flattering to Henry I and to his bastard son Robert. What better ancestor for a Norman king to claim than Arthur? most renowned and heroic of all the kings who ruled before the Saxons. After all, in Geoffrey's time, it was generally believed by folk that Arthur had actually been anointed and crowned King of England a mere 600 years before. Arthur himself put on a leather jerkin worthy of so great a king. On his head he placed a golden helmet with a crest carved in the shape of a dragon and across his shoulders a circular shield called Pridwen, on which there was painted a likeness of the Blessed Mary, Mother of God, which forced him to be thinking perpetually of her. He girded on his peerless sword called Caliburn, which was forged in the Isle of Avalon. But who was the real Arthur? In truth, hardly anything of him is known, and prior to the 12th century, his name occurs so rarely in manuscripts and historical records that it is difficult to understand how his fame has endured. There are only a handful of references to Arthur, the earliest being a fleeting acknowledgement of his skill in battle, which occurs in a 6th century poem by Anarin called Egododin. He fed black ravens on the ramparts of the fort, although he was no Arthur. The warrior referred to in these lines, having reduced vast numbers of the enemy to carrion, is nevertheless deemed by the poet as unable to match Arthur's reputation. 
It's extraordinary to think that Anarin may have written these words within one or two generations of Arthur's lifetime. The Godothan is um, a North British poem, that's to say it was written in a language um, similar to modern Welsh, uh, and which a modern Welshman can in part uh, still understand, um, probably uh, in the second half of the 6th century, uh, when people spoke a language, the ancestor of present-day Welsh, from the, river, from the Channel up to the River Forth in Scotland. And it tells about a King Minnethaug of Edinburgh, whose army set forth, 300 of them, and marched all the way south to Catterick in Yorkshire and fought a glorious battle against the um, English invaders, and there they um, were killed, but they died gloriously, as in the charge of the Light Brigade. And then this poem was written uh, to commemorate them. Uh, it's the source of much controversy amongst Welsh scholars, but I think the general agreement is that uh, the nucleus of it was a real poem written by a poet called Anairin in the 6th century. And the interesting part from an Arthurian point of view is that it does at one point actually mention Arthur. Although the first mention of Arthur may have been in Egodidin, there is an earlier record of 5th century Britain, but Arthur's name does not appear in it. It was written by the monk Gildas in about the year 540, and in it he denounces the rulers of his time and explains how Britain came to be in such a sorry state. Its title is The Ruin of Britain and it's an outright attack on the wickedness of the authorities and clergy of his day. And in the preface to the work, he tracks down the causes of that wickedness. In so doing, he provides a unique account of 5th century Britain, a backdrop to the rise of Arthur, yet one from which Arthur was strangely absent. This angry old monk took a dim view of the squabbling of the local British rulers, and he felt, with some justification no doubt, that their lack of moral fibre had both led to the supremacy of the heathen Saxon invaders and been punished by it. He likened the British plight to that of the Israelites, and he saw their predicament as divine retribution. Gildas was a northerner, possibly a Pict born on the wrong side of the Roman frontier, but lived most of his life in the south, and in that fact may lie the answer to his silence about Arthur. As a Pict, he may have had no love for a commander who spent his time driving back the Picts, who'd been a thorn in the British side for generations. In fact, the Picts had often allied with the Saxons and the Irish, causing yet more trouble for the British. Gildas was um, a cleric writing in the 6th century, and so he is unique and extraordinary from an Arthurian point of view because there is somebody whom no historian doubts was actually writing, and we do have his writing uh, from the, about the, sometime in the first half of the 6th century. Uh, but what's disappointing is that he doesn't mention Arthur. This has been taken by some historians to disparage the whole Arthurian story and to say, well, if the one person living at the time who wrote about it in some depth and who was lived... Um, within the time of people who would have actually known him and doesn't mention him, then how can anyone suggest he lived? He seems quite clearly, for reasons which I don't think we'll ever know, not to, to be able to tell you about certain things. For example, it's an absolutely undoubted fact that the Anglo-Saxon invaders were in possession of a very large part of eastern and southern Britain at this time. Yet you wouldn't know that from Gildas. So it's not extraordinary that he doesn't mention something very important. He doesn't tell you about the kings of North Britain who were reigning at that time. He's writing under some political stress. It seems to me that's quite clear. And that he, and that he ha could very easily have a reason for not writing about Arthur. Up until the early 400s, Britain had been prosperous and sophisticated. A true Roman province in which all freeborn Britons were Roman citizens and proud to be so. British society was headed by landed gentry in whose veins ran the blood of Celt, Roman and in some instances a mixture of other nationalities from the Roman world. There was a thriving agricultural and industrial economy due to Roman efficiency and organisation, which had controlled the province of Britain for just under four centuries. The breathtaking spectacle of a horde belonging to a prosperous Romano-British family of the time was recently uncovered in Suffolk. The exquisite workmanship and richness of the jewellery and the household items revealed bear witness that the owners of this treasure were living in style. None of this changed immediately when Rome severed its links with Britain in the year 410. 
When the Roman Emperor Honorius told Britain to look to its own defences, the former province was remarkably successful in doing just that, at least for a generation. Gildas attributes this continuing peace to the reign of a supreme ruler he names as Vortigern, and this expression is not a name or even a title, but is thought to have been a description rather like a nickname, as in the Celtic tongue, it means overlord or high king. He became High King of Southern Britain in about 425. At first, Vortigern did better than other petty rulers who had sprung up all over the country after the break with Rome. His nickname indicates that he had the support of the poorer classes as well as the aristocracy from whom he came. Otherwise, he would have been known by a Roman name. So it seems that because he could call upon the allegiance of such a large cross-section of the population, he maintained authority for almost a generation. But even Vortigern, with his widespread support, could not gather enough military strength to counter the ever-increasing pressures of all his frontiers. Vortigern had the idea, unwise as it later turned out, of employing a bunch of violent Jutish mercenaries, led by two brothers called Hengist and Horsa. Then came three keels, driven into exile from Germany. In them were the brothers Horsa and Hengist. Vortigern welcomed them then and handed over to them the island that in their language is called Thanet. Vortigern earned himself the undying hatred of the British for his mistake. These mercenaries were allowed to settle and within 20 years or so were abusing their host's hospitality and then rebelled against their British masters in the revolt of 441. Gildas goes on to say, all their inhabitants, bishops, priests and people were mown down together while swords flashed and flames crackled. Horrible it was to see the foundation stones of towers and high walls thrown down. There was no burial save in the ruins of the houses or in the bellies of the beasts and birds. Indeed, excavations in Caister by Norwich have revealed 36 charred bodies from that terrible time, found in the remains of a burnt-out building, silent witness to the ferocity of their Jutish attackers. Others had fled, never to return. Vortigern had let the Saxons in by the back door and would never be forgiven for it. In fairness, he had little choice in the matter, beset on all sides with no other hope of defence. The practice of hiring German mercenaries was by no means a new one. Indeed, the Romans had themselves done it, and there is much archaeological evidence for settlements of Angles and Saxons under Roman rule in Britain. By Arthur's time, the word Saxon had come to mean a multitude of Germanic settlers. And indeed, the modern word Sassanact is still used by the Scots today as a derogatory term for the English incomers. So, this is the world that Arthur grew up in, a world in which the Saxon expansion threatens still further a Britain destabilized without the protective cloak of Rome. The great country houses and estates of southern Britain were left to the wind and the rain, Large-scale farming and industry ran slowly down as the roads that the Romans had built became more and more unsafe. The Dark Ages, um, I must say to me, sometimes unconsciously conveys the idea of it's being almost always midwinter. Um, it really means a period of which we don't know very much. Uh, uh, it is also a period after the Roman occupation, when the legionary forces were withdrawn at the, end of the, at the beginning of the um, fifth century, when Britain was left to her own devices, and when we know that eventually the Engl ancestors of the English, who were uh, heathen barbarians, overtook and clearly ruined most of the island. Uh, the Roman fortresses were uh, destroyed and the villas um, fell into decay. But what we don't know is exactly how long this process 
took, and there's great disagreement among archaeologists and historians. And my own view, very briefly, uh, based on what I'm, uh, the latest discoveries, is that, um, that some form of Roman tradition did continue for a considerable time, probably maybe two th or three generations, um, it pro quite likely, I think, into the 6th century. And Gildas, whom I mentioned earlier, talks about people with um, Roman ranks, about uh, rectores, rulers, judges, and so forth, we find an inscription of um, five, the year 540 in North Wales, which refers to the, the, cons uh, the consular date at which the king died. So there were, a lot of Roman tradition went on. Most of the towns and cities deteriorated. Some decayed, some were stripped bare, others simply disappeared. It was truly the beginning of Britain's dark age. Petty warlords sprang up all over Britain, and inevitably the tribal violence which had lain dormant under centuries of Roman rule erupted with a new vigor. Leaders rose and fell at an astonishing rate, and the rule of law was no longer respected. More and more people fled to the towns and cities as supplies failed, some choosing migration to northern Gaul, others preferring to seek refuge in the newly refortified strongholds of their ancestors. Famine and plague claimed many. One such deserted Roman city is described in the earliest known Anglo-Saxon poem. Snapped roof trees, towers fallen, the work of the giants, the stonesmiths mouldereth. Rhyme scoureth gate towers, rhyme on mortar. Shattered the shower shields, roofs ruined, age underate them. And the wielders and the rites. Earth grip holds them, gone, long gone. Fast in graves grasp, while fifty fathers and sons have passed. Wall stood, grey lichen, red stone, kings fell often. The first serious historical documents in which Arthur is named were compiled meticulously by a Welsh monk in Bangor, North Wales. He's known to us as Nennius, and he was not the author of these documents. We might say he was the editor, but he himself admits in his preface to his History of the Britons in about 829 that his method of working was haphazard. I, Nennius, disciple of Elvodigus, have taken the trouble of writing down a few fragments which refute the stupidity of the British race of which they are accused because their learned men had no knowledge and had not written in books any record of that island of Britain. But I have made a heap of all that I could find, both in the Roman annals and in the chronicles of the Holy Fathers, that is, Jerome, Eusebius, Isidore and Prosper, and also from the annals of the Irish and Saxons, and from the traditions of our elders. Like Gildas before him, Nennius was a monk, but he had few literary aspirations, and he confined himself to arranging the assortment of ancient documents in what he thought was their true historical order. Whether he was as gripped by the figure of Arthur is not recorded, but by the ninth century when Nennius compiled the documents he had found, Arthur had become a folk hero, especially in Nennius's native Wales. Amongst those documents, the two most important are the Annals of Wales and Nennius's History of the Britons. The Annals are thought to contain accounts from 5th and 6th century history copied down at around 800. So they may have been altered at any time by monk copyists censoring or adding to text as they saw fit. People are very curious and often ask um, people like myself who are studying this period what sort of evidence there is. Well, in a sense, there's very little. The direct sources used by historians are very few, and we've, made, we've canvassed most of them. The only one we haven't, um, I haven't mentioned so far is um, the history of the Britons, which um, used to be attributed to Nennius, um, which is the most important, which was written in the year 829 in its present form. Um, but there's actually very little. There's the mention in um, the Godothen. There are other early Welsh verses. There's a Welsh poem in, uh, about Geraint, the Prince of Devon, which is uh, later than Arthur's time, but mentions Arthur. 
So there's not a great deal, but uh, what there is, is is highly suggestive. And there are other ways of examining the evidence. There is, of course, archaeology doesn't really tell us very much, unfortunately. It tells us a great deal about the conditions of life, to some extent about political conditions, because we can, the fortresses have been excavated and so on, but we don't really, for the most part, know who lived in those fortresses. And we don't really know whether Arthur lived in one or another. But what we do have is the history of the Britons, which in the year 800 records Arthur's 12 great battles. Most of the sites are not very easy. In fact, none of them is identified for certain. That, to my mind, is a bit of an argument for saying they're genuine, because it seems to me a forger would have um, picked on known and, and uh, well-known sites of the period. He doesn't. Uh, and to the extent that they can be satisfactorily identified, they do appear the sort of places you might expect battles at the beginning of the 6th century. In those days, the Saxons increased in numbers and grew stronger in Britain. But at Hengist's death, Arctha, his son, went from the northern part of Britain to the kingdom of Kent, and from him arose the kings of Kent. Then Arthur fought against those men in those days with the kings of the Britons, but he was the leader of battles. The first battle was in the mouth of the river which is called Glyne. The second and third and fourth and fifth on another river which is called Dubglas and is in the region Linnewis. The sixth battle on the river called Bassas. The seventh battle was in the forest of Celidon, that is, Cat Coet Celidon. The eighth battle was at the fort of Gwynion, in which Arthur carried the image of the Blessed Mary Ever Virgin on his shoulders. And the pagans were put to flight, and there was a great slaughter of them by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the grace of the Blessed Mary the Virgin, his mother. The ninth battle was fought in the city of the Legion. He fought the tenth battle on the shore of the river, which is called Tribruet. The eleventh battle was on the mountain called Agned. The twelfth battle was at Baden Hill, where 960 men perished at one charge of Arthur's, and no one killed them save he himself. And in all the battles he was victor. And they, when they were defeated in all the battles, sent for help to Germany, and their numbers were ceaselessly added to. And they brought kings from Germany to rule over those in Britain. It's clear from Nennius's account that Arthur was an experienced military campaigner and Nennius always refers to him using the Latin word for soldier, miles, pronounced miles, rather than calling him king. It's even possible that Arthur may not have been a name, but an epithet as Vortigen was. Some have claimed the name Arthur stems from the Roman name Artorius. A Roman officer called Artorius Justus served in Britain in the third century. But Arthur is not an unusual Celtic name of this time either. Another uh, suggestion which historians have advanced some, for some time is um, that the fact that a number of um, dynasties of the time are, uh, of kings whose genealogies have been preserved tend to uh, call their sons Arthur. This is in the genera two, three generations after the time when Arthur would have lived, which again suggests that there was uh, a famous Arthur after whom they wished to name their sons. And it's interesting too to me that um, most of these kings are in the north of Britain where I suspect um, that the real Arthur lived, possibly based on the old R Roman legionary fortress at York. Some think that Arthur and Ambrosius, mentioned by Gildas, were one and the same. Geoffrey of Monmouth invented a blood tie between Ambrosius and Arthur by making Arthur the son of Uther Pendragon, who was supposed brother to Ambrosius. But there is no historical evidence for this and no way of knowing who Arthur's parents were or where he was born. It's a commonly held belief that Arthur took up the struggle against the invaders where Ambrosius left off. 
Unusually, Gildas names Ambrosius, where he'd kept silence about other figures, notably Arthur. Of Ambrosius, he said, their leader was Ambrosius Aurelianus, a gentleman who, perhaps alone of the Romans, had survived the shock of this notable storm. Certainly his parents, who had worn the purple, were slain in it. It's plain that both Ambrosius and Arthur shared a strong desire to rid Britain of the heathen invaders, or at least to stem the tidal wave of eager Germanic, Pictish and Irish settlers. Perhaps Ambrosius invented Arthur with his authority and passed him the torch to bear onwards into the darkness. Knowing nothing about his background or descent, we can only assume that he must have come from a British family of some importance. The influence of Rome was still very strong in such noble families. Arthur may well have spoken in the local Celtic dialect, a type of primitive Welsh, but he would also have had a working knowledge of Latin as a matter of course. What he looked like and how old he was when he took up the fight, we cannot know. One thing can be said with certainty. He was a British military commander who appeared on the scene in the latter half of the 5th century and succeeded in curbing the Saxon incursions and in parts of Britain actually halting their advance altogether. The battles mentioned by Nennius took place over a wide area of Britain, roughly stretching from Strathclyde eastwards to Northumbria or possibly even to Lincolnshire and from Chester to some point southwest where Baden Hill saw a British victory so overwhelming that it subdued the Saxons for the following 50 years. As Gildas puts it, Baden was not the least slaughter of the hangdogs and also almost the last. Only two battle sites of the 12 mentioned by Nennius have been tentatively identified. But the important fact is that they indicate the scope and reach of the military force of which Arthur may have been the leader. Such a force, with its ability to respond to threats from all over mainland Britain, would have cavalry as its main component. The resounding defeat he inflicted on the Saxons at Baden demonstrated superbly that, in a pitched battle, cavalry had the edge over foot soldiers. The tradition of cavalry had been inherited from the Romans, whose most effective troops in the twilight of Rome's power had been their light or fast strike cavalry. The Celts themselves had a reputation for superb horsemanship. Indeed, they had sold their services as auxiliary cavalry the length and breadth of the old empire, and Rome had learned much from them. Now the wheel turned again, and all of that knowledge and experience passed once more into Arthur's hands. It's safe to assume that he, along with Ambrosius, revived the use of cavalry as a hammer with which to break the enemy ranks. We might get a better idea of um, Arthur's strategy if we could identify the battle sites, because they really are, I think, the most tantalizing clue. Uh, and it may be that the day will come when one of the sites is properly excavated and if we find evidence of a battle contemporary, then I think we would obviously be very near. Uh, but we wouldn't know, for instance, whether the battles occurred in successive years or all in the space of one campaign or over a time of the whole of Arthur's lifetime, so we wouldn't know much. Um, it's, it's from the early Welsh poetry we know how the battle was fought. It was, um, they were very stylized. Um, there was considerable use of, of, of cavalry, as I say. The nobles prided themselves rather like medieval knights, so there is a resemblance. Um, but there's nothing unusual about using cavalry. In fact, cavalry was usual among the Britons at that time, and um, I don't believe, and there's no evidence to suggest that this was imitating, as was suggested um, in the Oxford History of England, the armoured knights, the cataphracti of the late Roman Empire. Uh, I don't think so. This was um, an aristocratic form of warfare from these um, hill forts where they had their horses. Uh, and I think as much as anything, it reflects the um, aristocratic prejudice of the poets who are, not, who are writing for their kings um, and are writing about what they wish to know about, just as um, medieval minstrels write about the adventures of Lancelot and Gawain riding out in armour. But it doesn't mean that everyone did. It just means that the audience wanted to hear about that. But it does still reflect an aspect of the warfare.
But there is mention in the poems, allusions, um, that's not their prime interest, in um, ordered movements of troops, and there is an expression forming the battle pen, which does give the impression of a forming up a, a phalanx, maybe, of um, men with spears and shields. Uh, and it would be inconceivable that there wasn't um, some sort of discipline and order, and that indeed that the king, like Arthur, who carved a name for himself, and uh, if it was he won the great victory at Mount Bardon, didn't make use of um, superior tactics to his adversaries. Equally, the adversaries were obviously uh, very formidable indeed, or, or we wouldn't be speaking English at this interview. In contrast to Arthur's highly mobile and disciplined men, the Saxons mostly fought on foot, as indeed they continued to do right up to the Battle of Hastings. They had no apparent strategy because they had no sense of central leadership. Small bands of Saxons in one community would be loyal to one chief, but fought mainly for the love of it, with the added incentive of rich rewards if they won. Military discipline was not their strong suit and their war gear varied according to their means. Unlike the British under Arthur, for whom uniformity and consistency of equipment, particularly horse harness, would have been essential. In a large force, particularly cavalry, standardization of essential items of equipment would have been the only practical way to make the most of horses and men. Such a demand would have been met by a cottage industry of craftsmen, armorers, leather workers, and perhaps even field surgeons, as well as the more obvious baggage train of cooks and quartermasters. The logistics of directing so complicated a piece of military machinery indicates that Arthur must have been as capable a diplomat as he was a soldier, for to keep his men and horses fully effective, vast resources would have been needed. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that the church, with its great wealth, was one of Arthur's main benefactors. But whether it did so willingly or with a little prompting is hard to say. Certainly in the first few centuries following Arthur's lifetime, the record-keeping clergy seem to have been unwilling to give him any credit, as Gilda's silence on the subject of Arthur may perhaps bear witness. Well, as I've said earlier, that the, the direct sources are very sparse and for the most part, unfortunately, not that satisfactory. They require an enormous amount of discussion and evaluation. <clears throat> but I suppose if one were to look for a parallel, it would not be back in the imperial Roman past, uh, nor in the Knights of the Middle Ages, but it would be in what was going on in, in Gaul across the Channel at this time, which is far better documented because people were writing uh, letters and so forth which have survived. And there we do see, I would think, a rather similar picture to Britain. For example, um, you have in northern Gaul um, a Roman leader, Syagrius, who is still acting as a Roman officer, though he's now cut off completely from um, Rome itself. Um, we have in the letters in the 5th century of Sidonius and other people, long correspondence has survived of these Roman aristocrats living on in their villas, sometimes um, perfectly peacefully and, and in, on good terms with the local Gothic king or Frankish king, writing, corresponding, even acting on their behalf. There's a description of a Gaulish... Um, landlord, landowner, young and dashing man called Ectidius, who with, I think, a handful of horsemen, I forget the number, a dozen, rides through the whole of a Gothic besieging army in order to relieve the city in um, southern Gaul. So if you read those sources, which are accessible, then I think that gives perhaps a more clear impression of what was going on in Britain than uh, the speculation which were from much later sources which have survived in this country. And one has to remember, too, that uh, historically what happened in Gaul seems to be happening on another planet because we read that as a separate part of history. But the real Arthur, or the real people who lived at that time, the real Kai and Bedouia, Kay and Bedivere, knew what was going on to some extent. They talked with merchants delivering wine at ports on the southern and western coasts. They themselves must occasionally have travelled there. The whole enormous historical events can, can and must have taken place of which we know nothing. And I think, therefore, again, studying the history of Gaul, which is so much better documented, does give one a much um, fairer and more a clear picture. Whilst British resources ensured that each man had the bare essentials, 
there must have been a fair amount of looting and opportunist stealing, so that as time passed, at least the higher ranks of each side would have had items such as chain mail, helmets, and possibly even swords, which had been taken from the enemy. Arthur's men may have, if they took Rome as their model, carried long straight cavalry swords, or spears, or both. They may have carried shields, but even if they didn't, they would almost certainly have worn body armour of either chain mail, leather armour or scale. The latter is vulnerable to upward thrust, not a wise choice of armour for a cavalryman. Before Geraint, the enemy's scourge, I saw white horses, tensed red. After the war cry, bitter the grave. In Llangborth, I saw the clash of swords, men in terror, bloody heads, before Geraint the Great, his father's son. In Llangborth, I saw spurs, and men who did not flinch from spears, who drank their wine from glass that glinted. In Llangborth, I saw Arthur's heroes, who cut with steel, the emperor, ruler of our labour. In Llangborth, Geraint was slain, heroes of the land of Dovnight. Before they were slain, they slew. Under the thigh of Geraint, swift charges, long their leg, wheat their fodder, red, swooping like milk-white eagles. When Geraint was born, heaven's gate stood open. Christ granted all our prayer. Lovely to behold the glory of Britain. Of course, Arthur would have had more than just cavalry at his disposal. The units of foot soldiers he commanded would have been a mixture of the descendants of old soldiers who had served under the regular Roman army, volunteers from the villages and farms, and in the remaining British controlled towns, any such town militia that could be spared, and were acceptable to the Dux Bellorium, the war leader or leader of battles as Arthur is often called. The weapon of choice for an average foot soldier on the British side is likely to have been the spear, because swords were expensive to produce, they remained almost exclusively the weapons of the nobility or those fortunate enough to acquire them on the field of battle. Shields were the principal form of protection for these poorer British folk who couldn't possibly afford body armour, let alone iron helmets. But unlike the professionally produced and finished shields of the earlier Roman troops, these would have been edged with rawhide and possibly painted in crude copies of the patterns of the Roman legions. Iron helms were rare in the Saxons' ranks too, even amongst nobility. Spears were the most common weapon on both sides. In contrast to the sword, very little skill or training is needed to use the spear effectively enough to injure or to kill. Very few actual weapons have been found from this time that can be said to be definitely British. One reason for this may be that the Britons, being mostly Christians, had abandoned the practice of burying their weapons with their dead, whereas the Saxons, very much still a pagan and warrior society, still persisted in consigning their most treasured possessions, including their swords, spears, mail shirts and helmets to the grave. Anno Domini 516 to 518. The Battle of Baden, in which Arthur carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for three days and three nights on his shoulders, and the Britons were victorious. The aim of such a huge infantry army pushing so far into British territory must surely have been to overcome and destroy the main British cavalry force, which was, after all, the only thing standing between them and mastery of all Britain, and also to wipe out the British base. The Saxon army was composed of the armies of Kent and of the South and West Saxons under the overall leadership of Ale and was for those days an enormous force of warriors. 
Arthur's cavalry was probably no more than a thousand. And if it was a siege, the hard-pressed cavalry needed a steep hill for the dismounted warriors to hold against the greater numbers of the Saxons, and there are many such hills outside Bath. And on one of these hills, Arthur triumphed. At Baden, Arthur crushed the Saxons so thoroughly that it was to take them decades to recover. He created, by brute force, a breathing space for his fellow Britons. For a while at least, they need not fear the ravages of the Saxon sea wolves. Arthur had won a peace and could expect to enjoy the acclaim of the people. Though he was never a king, he did more than any king of Britain had ever done. Although many of them were of nobler descent than he was, he was nevertheless twelve times designated commander. Peace may have brought Arthur rewards, as well as the gratitude of the British. For a warlord of his stature, it would be quite natural for him to seek a permanent stronghold. An ancient hill fort at South Cadbury in Somerset, last inhabited at the time of the Roman invasion, had been shown by archaeologists to have been re-fortified at the end of the 5th century, when Arthur's military career was at its peak. In the centre of this hill fort stood a great feasting hall, with a lofty thatched roof and gabled at each end. Was this the Camelot of legend, where Arthur celebrated his greatest victories? History is so far silent. Anno Domini 539, the Battle of Camlan, in which Arthur and Modred perished, and there was a plague in Britain and Ireland. Arthur got his peace and perhaps was able to enjoy it for a short while. The Saxon threat had been warded off and the country could once again flourish. But the old hostilities resurfaced between the petty chieftains. Civil war broke out and Arthur may have been drawn into it. Legend says he and his son died at each other's hands in a fatal power struggle. Yet men say in parts of England that King Arthur is not dead, but had by the will of our Lord Jesus into another place, and men say that he shall come again. I will not say it shall be so, but rather will I say that here in the world he changed his life. But many men say there is written upon his tomb this verse, here lies Arthur, the once and future king. <laughs>